Life Audio. Welcome to Christian Natural Health with naturopathic Dr. Lauren DeVille. Christian Natural Health is the podcast on how to get and stay healthy God's way. You'll hear topics on nutrition, exercise, sleep, avoiding toxicity, meditating on scripture, what supplements to take, stress management, defeating anxiety and worry, how to reconcile Eastern medicine approaches with Christianity, and a whole lot more. Now, here's your host, Dr. Lauren. Is life feeling chaotic? I get it. I'm Rachel Wojo, host of the Untangling Life podcast. Don't miss the passionate encouragement and faith-based resources you need to help you clear your head and calm your heart. As Shell says, it feels like Rachel always knows what I need to hear. She keeps it real and is so humble. Her podcast is just the cherry on top. Enjoy Untangling Life with Rachel Wojo on lifeaudio.com or your favorite podcast app now. The Historical Jesus Podcast is the sweeping saga of the life and times of Galilean Jesus of Nazareth, as well as the faith, religion, and church founded to honor and disseminate his acts and teachings. Join me, Mark Vinette, on this fascinating journey through time, exploring the many great works of Christian theology, literature, architecture, music, and art inspired by the words and deeds of Jesus Christ. Welcome back to another episode of Christian Natural Health. Today, I'm excited to have Steve Weidman with us. Steve is the CEO of Weidman Consulting Company. Specializing in SEO strategy, Steve likes to organize search into specific disciplines broken down by business model. For natural search, Steve believes in three fundamental requirements, relevancy, visibility, and user behavior. For local search, data, landing page, citation, and reputation are keys to success. While serving as an adjunct professor at UCSD and CSUF, Steve is also building the Academy of Search while volunteering time to help improve transparency and industry standards as an agency trainer. At the forefront of SEO, Steve has a front row seat to how AI is changing the landscape of various industries. Welcome, Steve. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Lauren. Excited to talk about uh, search and AI and all this cool technology that's uh, that's evolving every day. Yeah, absolutely. So I know very little about AI. I'm specifically interested in hearing more about how AI is going to change healthcare. So sure. tell us a little bit about kind of AI in general first. Like how has it changed in the last, I think, nine months is when it sort of went from futuristic to suddenly it's everywhere. So uh, the world has changed. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's almost like the like the internet just got invented, right? Remember that back in the 90s? It was it was this huge, exciting, I and mean, it had been around obviously longer than that, but the adoption of it when it exploded and everybody started using the internet before the bubble burst in 2000, it was it was something new that allowing consumers to be able to, to now plug into their computers and get access to everything, to music, to, to downloading documents, to finding information, you know, without having to go to a public library. It was a it was a whole evolution in what was what was changing in the technology world. And AI is is very similar in in that same sort of perspective, in that now instead of just searching for the things that we're we're trying to find and and discovering different options, we're getting answers from machines that have been fed information and learned from that information and now can can basically articulate it in ways that we can understand. And so it's it's almost like being able to talk to the computer and having the computer talk back to you as opposed to um, punching in keywords into a search engine and getting those results. So it's it's um, it's a whole nother paradigm. And beyond the point of just getting information, AI now can do other things as well, which um, includes things as simple as writing a resume for you. You know, again, just by putting in some input or or creating some prompts, right? That's where, how we're we're connecting with it. We're creating prompts. The new job, by the way, if if you're out there looking for new industries and fields to get into is prompt engineers. I've heard some of them get paid as much as 300000 a year to be prompt engineers. And that is writing the right questions to ask the computers to get them to do things and produce things that um, otherwise would take sometimes weeks, months, years to create, including things like coding and um, and formulas and answers to questions, which I suppose is the catalyst to your most interested topic is healthcare, right? How can we find solutions 
to um, to problems that our scientists haven't figured out yet. Well, if we can feed these computers the right amount of, of input and data and research, there's a possibility that some of this AI could punch out some um, some starting points of what might be the next way to find cures for things that our scientists haven't been able to figure out yet. We've got all this input and all these data points, but we don't necessarily have the the brain power, machine power, you know, that that these computers will, especially as they continue to evolve over the next few years. So really, really interesting technology for sure. I have so many questions based on what you just said. So um, <laughs> as, you far, start? as far as like the, the input that you're describing, this almost sounds like I mean, there is kind of an art to searching like Google terms, like knowing what to say in order to get the right response. So that's what you're talking about, kind of, except you're feeding it to the AI, giving it the right like phraseology so that it knows what to go out and search. Is that what you mean? Sort of. So so if you think about Google as a, as a search engine, right, Google has a, a what they call a web crawler, a little bot or a spider is another term, term for it. And what it's doing is it's crawling through the Internet and it's finding content to put in its index. Sometimes it'll find a page and it'll say, well, this page isn't necessarily safe for visitors because it doesn't have a, a secure certificate or, um, you know, the information I found on this page, I've already found somewhere else. So it's kind of duplicate of something else. So it kind of crawls and decides what it's going to um, put in its index, right? Crawls, indexes, and then depending on how users interact with that content, when they display it in their search results, they'll decide where they want to rank it over time in, in the results based on their, you know, their, their searcher's behavior. But it's really just a database of URLs that it finds on the internet. Where AI, on the other hand, is is almost like a uh, an information database, more than, uh, or less than a list of websites that contain possible information. So it takes all the the information that it knows from what you feed it, and that's that's where the controversy comes in: is who's feeding these these large language models all this information? Is it Google, and how much is Google giving to to their system called Bard? Is it Chat GPT and the developers who created it that can decide what goes into, you know, the, um, you know, the uh, amount of information that, that will be displayed or, or, um, or used by consumers. So that's where kind of that controversy comes from. It doesn't go out to the internet and explore and create and, and learn from it. Instead, it's fed information specifically by developers. And yeah, some of it, some of it does source from the web. I think um, chat GPT went up to 2021 when they, you know, allowed it access to articles and things on the internet. But what it's doing, though, is it's in real time, these large language models in real time, when you punch in a question, are are writing an answer in, in real time based on what it has in its knowledge base. Whereas when you go to Google and you perform a search for, I don't know, an iPad case or something, it's going to access the database that contains a list of websites that might be helpful or a list of product listings or a list of ads or all three um, to display those listings to give you some options. So the difference, I think, is is people who are... Um, depending on, on kind of where they are when they're searching and what their intent is, they're either looking for answers, which is where they'll go to chat and say, I need an answer to something, or they're looking for options where they might bypass that that whole generative AI section within the search results and go straight to the web results to look for options. So I, I think that's that's kind of the differentiator is if, hey, I, I need an answer to something, um, we as, as consumers are going to get smarter about how we um, create prompts. In fact, we're getting smarter at how we create tools that enable us, uh, that enable tools to create prompts for us so that we can ask a question and the the tool will come back with a follow-up question such as, are you looking for this? Are you uh, more interested in that? As opposed to us just punching in a question and expecting the right answer to come up. So there's all these browser plugins. There's all sorts of third-party tools that are coming up. I have one on my phone. I think it's called Genie. It's called Genie that uses chat GPT and, and gives you a little bit more interaction with AI as opposed to just you figuring out the right question to ask. So um, that's it's getting really, really fun and interesting, but it's it's um it's a new paradigm for how we are how we are going to transact, find information and build things. We no longer as consumers have to write our own resumes, right? We can have it generated. Um, you know, buy something that that um, can write it for us and be very articulate. We no longer have to spend an hour researching a search result to extract the the terms and the entities that are important to our content. We can ask the AI to do that. Um, you know, we no longer have to to write and validate code 
for you know for uh, websites for programming software we can go out to these tools now and say write me a piece of code that does x write mm-hmm. me the html i'll need for a web page um, on this topic it can do all of that work for us saving us hours and hours and hours of time so really amazing um evolution of um of what we can do now as as humans that we couldn't do before february of this year so really really exciting well and i thought that chat gpt the first iteration that was available to consumers was november right and then they had an update that came out in february is that correct so right so the the chat gpt 4 is the latest and greatest and this is the one that has all the the bells and whistles of what we'd hope for i heard something about a five coming too but then I've I've heard kind of both sides. So who knows who knows if it's going to happen or not. But um, but the adoption of it, the blow up, really happened in February. So and we and we can see that too. We can see that, and even some of our our search data. It's it's really interesting when you go into some of these free tools that search engines give you, like Google Search Console and and Bing Webmaster Tools. Um, it's really interesting to see that the ways that that questions and queries are evolving. You're seeing longer you know, questions now because people are starting to use chat GPT more and they'll go back to Google and they'll ask the same kind of long questions. And if you're, if you're opted in to the new Google uh, labs, which is free to do, by the way, you can actually see the new generate uh, generative AI right within Google search results. You just have to go to, to Google labs, sign up for it and choose generative AI. And then when you perform a search right after you perform a search, it's going to give you that chat result and Below it will still be the web results. Really um, interesting. And I don't know if it's going to stay or not, but we'll see. So to clarify what you said a little bit ago about where the controversy comes in, it sounds like there's almost, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that the AI is almost like a middleman where he's synthesizing, he is synthesizing all of the information as you're doing the research and it's saying, let's take this, let's not take that. This is a a valid source and therefore we're going to say all of these people agree, therefore this is ultimately what we know, as opposed to the search result where you can get conflicting opinions and then you make up your own mind. Is that, is that kind of sort of it? Yeah, in a way. I mean, there's there's still there's still safe filters available on search engines. You've seen those, right? That uh, we put them on for our kids and make sure they don't find information that or or content that's inappropriate for their age. Um, so there's there's still filters. Um, I think with the with the AI, the concern is that the filters are around uh, what uh, what the developers want to be available to consumers. So um, if you try to type in something like how to um, how to build a bomb or how to um, how to create arsenic or something, right? They're, they've got these filters in place to say, "Hey, I'm I'm sorry, that's inappropriate," or you know, it's it's not something that I'm able to help you with, you know. So so prompt engineers are out there trying to figure out ways around it. And the first the first thing we all did as search engineers was we asked these these chat engines. We said, "How do you rank content? How do you decide what's going to be displayed in your results? Because we want to know is there anything different we need to do with these new." Um, upgraded search engines that do more than just you know provide results um, that can help our clients who all want to appear when somebody's performing a search for you know their product or service. So yeah, it's 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 fed by it's created by engineers that that um, that decide what goes in, right, and and how it can be used. And that's kind of where that controversy comes from because you know in a, in our our economy we don't like filters. We like to be able to see and do and, and have access to everything. And that's, that's where Facebook's getting a lot of flack with how they're experimenting with AI and they want to make it just completely open. You know, you hear all these different stories about how, you know, they don't want to have filters. They want you to be able to, to use it however you want to. And that's where the danger comes in and all the, you know, the, the thought leaders in the world of AI are like, Whoa, you're, you're talking matrix stuff. Now you're, you're giving too much control to artificial intelligence and we don't know if we can stop that control once it gets out and i think that's that's their biggest concern so now we've got a battle between you know the folks who are creating amazing things and the folks whose jobs are to to balance what what is acceptable uh, for society and some people are like well who are you to tell us right, right. what's acceptable for society yeah that makes sense so coming yeah. To what you said before about like kind of future of healthcare. So you took it in a direction that I thought was a little different. I was thinking more like the consumer level, but the idea of asking it solve big questions of like curing diseases that maybe we haven't been able to do yet. So yeah. I'm assuming what you mean by this is that you, if, if you know exactly how to prompt it, it can go search out all of the published data out there 
Whereas like individuals will just have to know where to look. They'll have to say like, I postulate that maybe this might help this disease. And then they have to go do the research and the AI can comb all of the research out there and collate right. it and say, here's some things that might work. You might want to investigate this further. Is that, it? did I understand that correctly? Correct. hundred percent. And, and it's, it's so interesting too, because you, you, you look at what AI can do. There's, there's people who are using it to try to pass bar exams and medical exams and it's doing it. It's actually it's actually creating, um, it's actually helping to to find the right answers to questions on some of the hardest tests that you could take for law and for medical. So we know if it can do that, it can take the same input, like you just mentioned, from any documents that has been fed, learn from it, and and create possible solutions and formulas. I'm so excited to see what it can do for, you know, for illnesses and diseases and cancers and um, I think it's going to be really exciting, but at the same time, we also don't want AI going out there and saying, "Oh, you've got a a, a rash. You should take this medicine." Right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, and and regardless of of whether the data is right or wrong, um, you know, there's there's ethics there. There's there's even morals at some point of of what goes into you know our our personal health. Google's always done a great job of addressing that with web search. They they've created their their whole quality raters guidelines and um, they do a really good job of of something they call your money your life and if if there's information that can't be validated or that they they don't necessarily trust then that content might get demoted whereas fact checked information that it already kind of piecemeals together when it reads a page and says yeah this appears to be accurate and fact checked on a website that i already trust that users have have interacted with in the past I'll display that result higher up in the search results. So I imagine that BARD and uh, the new generative AI within the web results are probably going to incorporate a lot of those same types of, of your money, your life filters. Uh, I hope they do because it, it definitely scares me to think that my kids might be looking to, to Dr. BARD right? yeah. <laughs> instead of um, you know actually talking to their physician. Okay, so let me pause for a second. Can you define the Google's Bard and, a and generative AI? Are these just like their versions, their answer to chat GPT, just a different company developing the same thing, essentially? That yes, uh, so right. So so AI in general, artificial intelligence is is um, machine learning that, that's fed and created by engineers. Um, large language models such as Bard and chat GPT take all that information and basically translate it in a way that we can understand it. And pretty soon in pretty much every language that exists on the planet, which is incredible to be able to take information and, and, uh, and write it and spit it back to a, a, a person in a way that they can understand it and, and even dumb it down. If you asked it to tell me um, like I'm a five-year-old, right. And it'll rewrite it and tell you like you're a five-year-old so that you understand it. That's what a large language model does. And that's what BARD and ChatGPT do is they take um, the AI technology and the information within that generative AI. And a large language model is, you know, what translate it in the, in, translates it in a way that we can consume it. Now, there are other ways that we can use generative AI that's not large language models, right? There's the coding we talked about, you know, being able to create code and 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 do actual actions and things that aren't just tell me something, right? So that's that's where generative AI gets really exciting because there's there's unlimited infinite possibilities of of what um you know if I, I suppose we could say what the matrix can do, right? Um but but um large language models are sort of like a neo or a program that you can interact with where the AI itself is just creating all sorts of amazing things. Okay. So generative AI is like the the big definition of all of them and bard is a specific group that takes that and utilizes it and chat gpt is a different one from bard correct yep built by different engineers but they do very similar things they're just fed different uh, information sources okay. and bard has access to the internet whereas chat gpt i think stopped uh, in 2021 but now there are extensions and plugins and ways that you can still access the internet but it's more of a uh, a band-aid i suppose compared to bard that can uh, and here's the difference, right? I, I I use this every day. I read articles from Search Engine Land, Search Engine Journal, Search Engine Roundtable, all these different sites where every day I'm I'm learning more and consuming information about what's happening in my industry, which can take a lot of time. So for a while, if there was an older article and I was reading up on something, I would put it into ChatGPT and I would say, 
um, give me the, the top five uh, takeaways and five action items from this article. And then I'd do the same thing. If I didn't feel like I got enough, give me five more. And what was happening in some cases, it'd say, I'm, um, I don't have access to the internet beyond 2021. I'm like, oh, it's so frustrating. So now mm-hmm. I can I can actually go to Bard and I can punch in that URL and say, give me the you know top five action items um, and t- top five takeaways. And it saved me loads of time to be able to you know to to get the key points from you know a, 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 what they call a skyscraper article that somebody created you wow. know with the intent of you know I'm sure of of trying to generate press and PR. And I was like, it's great for you, but for us consumers who are really busy and have busy lives, I don't have to read all your fluff now. I can go straight to what I need, you know <laughs> what I mean, and get to the point. So now my my 30 minutes a day is down to 10 or less, which is amazing from a productivity standpoint. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and then it seems like if ChatGPT no longer has access to the internet after 2021 and BARD does, it seems like there would be less controversy surrounding BARD because it wouldn't have restrictions on it based on what input it got. Is that correct? Uh, well, there are extensions now, so it does it does allow you to do a lot of the same same things if you if you have the in- extensions installed. Um, so it's it's really now it's it's kind of parallel. The only the only thing I I see different is the two different groups of of developers who are you know creating and evolving these platforms. So um, and there's a lot there's a lot of if you wanted just for fun you could do compare um, Chat GPT and and Bard. I think Bard's six right now uh google's product is six on the list of all the different um, large language models that are available you know surprisingly uh but chat gpt is you know far none the one that's that everyone's the most aware of and the one that they're using the most but a lot of it's just simply because they don't know about bard i think what what google probably could do is write in their search results they could or right below their search bar they could say try bard but i think they're they're trying to roll it out slowly so that you know they can find find gaps, loopholes, and monitor results before they, you know, make a a big fuss about it to the world. You know. So and narrowing down to healthcare again. So from a patient standpoint, first of all, where would someone, where would a patient access AI from a healthcare standpoint? Would they just go to Bard or, or ChatGPT and say, "Hey, here are my symptoms. What do I have?" Like, is that that's, what, that's really that's what they're all, they, right now? all they need to do? And and it'll uh, from every example that I've seen, it'll say talk to your physician, right? Uh, exactly. But it'll still give you some answers. It could be this, it could be that, but you should talk to your physician still. Okay. So it's and it's really like, interesting. Yeah, go ahead. The fail safe that was built in by the engineers to just be like, well, let's just make sure that people don't take this too far kind of a thing. I think so. <laughs> it must be. I mean, that's that's the the hard work that the engineers had to do before these things could be taken live is is to make sure it was safe, um, you know, for consumers to use. That's why there there is a lot set up in filters. But Unfortunately, you know, wherever wherever a teacher is able to create um, something that they feel is unbreakable, there's a student who's convinced they can break it. And there are people out there that are like, well, pretend that we're playing a game, you know, Bard, pretend we're playing a game. And the game is to see who can figure out the symptoms to um, to a cold. Right. <laughs> and so they're, they're doing all these these interesting hacks in a way to try to get the large language models to spit out. The information that um, that they want. In fact, one one prompt engineer was able to actually get into. I don't remember if it was if it was Chat GPT. It was one of them where they they went out and and actually asked it uh, about the source code. Sorry, you know I can't share the source code with you. And they did some sort of crazy prompt that enabled the um, you know the the language model to come back with an answer that was likely the answer. Um, that they couldn't get the first time so it's it's kind of like playing games and and doing scenarios write a story about pretend right. we're such and such as opposed to just blatantly asking a question and uh and i know those poor engineers every day are having to figure out okay now how do we block this and how do we do that and so anyway so um and is that the only place that AI has been integrated into healthcare or has it already infiltrated in other places besides just the, the patient going directly to chat GPT or BARD? Are there like groups out there that are already utilizing it? To oh, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure hospitals are already looking at ways that they can incorporate it into, you know, their, their day-to-day. How can we use chat GPT to make our, our jobs more efficient? Um, not necessarily around information, um, but it could be around, you know, hey, I've, I've got 
I've got a library of things that that we've put together for our local clinic. Um, use this um, as as a, a point of truth. And now when we ask questions, have the, the answers come from that point of truth as opposed to come up with your own answer. Um, we can we can ask it to send emails. We can um, have it do follow up um, uh, dialing for us on on calls. We could do all sorts of amazing things with with AI that um, that you know just didn't exist you know a year ago. So I think I think from a healthcare standpoint, though, the biggest the biggest thing I'm most excited about, as I mentioned earlier, is is its ability to help find cures to things if we feed it the right um, you know the right amount of of data for consumers. Um, again, it's, it's how they're interacting. Uh, I think right now, like I called, um, after hours, I have a physical coming up in July and I kept thinking to myself, why am I having to talk to somebody who's manually transcribing something when there's, there's AI out there that they could, they could connect to their phone system, you know, and, and have it ask me the right prompts, right? When somebody calls, ask this question, record the answer, ask this question, record the answer, transcribe, send the information to the front desk. Right. It could do that. But, you know, again, you need the, you know, the, the tech folks to go in and, and help those offices set that kind of technology up. It's out there, but somebody needs to come in or a platform needs to come in to enable those types of tools. So that way you can streamline your your workflow and the things that you're doing at the front desk and uh, and so forth, um, especially with medical records. You know, I mean, you, when you go in, you, you know, this you have this big folder of all the different medical records, you know, with with A.I., it can consume all that and you can simply ask a question. Does does this patient have a history of X, right? And it says, yes, according to um, this document on this page, um, they did have a record of it or no, they didn't, but they have a, a family history of it according to the records. Right. AI could spit that kind of information out if it was, you know, uh, if the interface was created between the technology and the, the hospital, the clinic, uh, the physician, et cetera. Uh, that's where it can really speed things up for the doctors. So they don't have to read through all the files. They can simply ask the question to the AI. AI will access the documents, you know, and tell them, you know, the information they need to help make an educated decision about what to recommend for the the patient. So, and from the physician standpoint, like my first thought is HIPAA. Like, are we going to be worried about there this, there being some kind of a breach here? But I suppose it's just like anything else that you contract with, as long as there's a HIPAA agreement in place, it's everything's kosher more or less. I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it now, I mean, we never had this 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. Um, we had medical records with all sorts of different providers and we have to send them, have to fax them in at one point. I remember back in the day, can you fax the records of such and such, you know, and send the x-rays? So oh, it's going to take a week to get the rec- x-rays over, you know, and now you can just log in and see all your healthcare records in one platform for the most part, you know, and and it's all stored online and, and doctors all have access, hopefully at this point, to all the same information. Um, we didn't have that 20 years ago because of HIPAA and regulations and how we could do things. But at some point they got through it all. And now we can have medical records, you know, injected into a, a device on our arm if we wanted to. And at any point they can just scan it and have your entire medical history and, and background and not have to go to 20 different, um, you know, professionals to get all the different information from, you know, uh, eyes and skin and, and, um, you know, and, and your primary, it, it can all be, you know, uh, aggregated into one spot for anyone to be able to look at and, and hopefully for AI later to predict, you know, the, the types of things that can help us from a preventative medicine standpoint. Right. So with any technology, there's always like the good and the bad, like it's an, it's a neutral tool, but it can be used for good or evil, essentially. What's your take on, you know, the debate surrounding, we really need to put the brakes on AI because we don't know where this is going to go. And like some people will be like doomsday prophesiers that this could be the end of humanity if to go to the, the, the crazy extreme. And then on the other side, this could be the beginning of utopia. Where do you fall on all of that? You know, I've, I've kind of always considered myself more of a scholar. I love to to learn. I love to watch. I love to observe. Um, some things, you know, are, are put out in a way to make you feel scared, you know, but um, I don't know. I, I kind of like to just test for myself. And I I, I look at things as, as it's not something that is going to globally blanket everyone. I feel like every every clinic, every hospital, every physician is going to have their their own pace and how they adopt, use, test the technology. They're not just going to say, hey, we're we're doing this now and this is the way it's going to be. It's going to be, hey, we're going to test for a few days this new tech 
and see if it's helpful to us and see if our patients like it. I think every every individual at the mic at the micro level is going to adopt it at a pace that they feel is comfortable. You know, and and if there seems to be some sort of a uh, a global issue where we start to see a percentage of these things go wrong, I think at that point, um, you know, the the industries as we communicate through open forums and social are going to see those things and address them as they happen. So I'm I'm a little less worried about you know, a, a button click and we all go away. In fact, there's a, a movie right now, was it Oppenheimer about the, the atom bomb, right? Atom bombs out there, it exists and it can at any point destroy everything, but it hasn't happened, you know, in what, like a hundred years. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't have that same sort of worry. You know, and I try not to worry about anything I can't control anyway. I try to focus on, you know, what's in my, my circle of control, but it's, it's all interesting, fascinating, and uh, I try to take more of the scholarly look on it and and learn and get my facts before I just, you know, panic. <laughs> also yeah. just use it because it's a tool and it's available to make our lives better, essentially. So. And it's nerdy and fun. It's geeky. I, I actually helped my daughter's boyfriend get a job using ChatGPT. I said, give me some basic information about what your experience is in certain things. Um, and then I said, okay, with this experience, write me a resume for a 17 year old looking for a, a, you know, an entry level job at a restaurant. And it did, he took it in and he got the job <laughs> and it was fun. It only took me five minutes to do it. So I, I love the time saving productivity, efficiency um, capabilities that this new technology gives us. Uh, yeah. So is it still the case that in order to use chat GPT, you have to like give it, you, you have to, to create an account, right? To log in and, and have a chat with it that way, but with Bard, but you don't same thing i know bard you, you don't even need well you need a google account but um bard you can just go to bard.google.com and start playing around now i was at an event last week uh called profcon where i was kind of helping teachers teach seo and trying to trying to encourage them to empower students to start using it they're afraid of their students using it because they're afraid they're going to say write my essay for me yeah. and, and they're doing yeah. that and there are tools to manage it um but i think setting the right expectations with with students so that you don't worry about it quite as much and, and there are going to be some filters to prevent it will hopefully enable teachers to give students ways that they can leverage it. So I need you to write an article about, um, I don't know, the changes in healthcare. Um, great. So here's what I want you to do. Start with BARD and ChatGPT and ask for topic ideas, right? Um, one of the first questions that that I, I had them ask is um, ask, ask ChatGPT or BARD what are some questions I should be asking my teacher to make the most out of this course? Wow. That's a good and idea. so why not do the same as a patient and say, Hey, I'm having some trouble with such and such, but I'm not really sure how to articulate it to my, my, um, you know, my doc, my doctor, what are, what are some questions I should be asking my doctor about this thing that that's going on with me? You know, ask those types of questions because the AI will give you some, some really interesting ideas that might inspire better questions to, you know, to the healthcare professionals that are taking care of you. Help lead them to the right answer. Absolutely. And a lot of it really does come down to asking the right questions. And sometimes you have to be really creative to, to elicit them. So that's great. Sure. Uh, what have I not asked you that you think is important to leave with our audience? I don't know. I think, I think one thing that I, I would start doing, because again, this is an evolution, is is start using the technology. Just like when the internet came out, we all were like, "What is this this internet thing?" Right? Um, I would I would probably set some goals and say, in the, in the next twelve months, what are some things I want to test with this tool to see how I can make my business better, to see how I can I can improve my time management, to see how I can improve my budget. Right. You can actually input information into these these tools that will enable you. I even asked uh, chat GPT. I'm like, hey, I'm, I want to I want to be able to buy a house in one year from now. Here's my credit score and how much money I make. How much will I need? Uh, what will my budget need to look like for me to be able to get a house in a year? And it broke it down for me in details, uh, in real detail. So it was it was pretty incredible. So I would say the one thing I would I would recommend to everybody is is get in there and start playing with it and and ask questions um not just to the the tool but to to forums and groups um to find out ways that other people are using it what are prompts like what are prompts that people use in my industry what are prompts that um that people will use to make their lives easier and better start asking those kind of questions and start incorporating some of those into your you know your your day to day so that you you start using it on a daily basis. One other thing I've done too is on my phone, 
I've put in that that genie I mentioned, which uses Chat GPT and Bard are both shortcuts right on my homepage. So wow. now instead of using Google and and Bing, I'll start there if I need an answer. And then I'll go out to search if I didn't get what I was looking for. So start, you know, just by using them on a day to day in um, in lieu of search engines just to start, you know, really um, uh, getting comfortable with the technology. But ask ask everyone, how are you using it? What are some ways that, that you're using it to make your life better? I would do that at least five minutes a day. Yeah, that's really clever. So the uh, Bard is an app now, like you can download it on your phone as an app? Essentially, you just basically create a shortcut. You can create a shortcut to any website. Um, you know, from um, when you go to the site, you can just on your phone, uh, just go up to the top and create short uh, desktop shortcut, and it'll add it right to your homepage. Awesome! Oh, very cool. Well, thank you so much. Where can people go to find out more about you and your company? Oh, I'm I'm all over social. I, I think my my nickname that's stuck with me over the years is just SEO Steve. So you can find me everywhere: Twitter, um, you know, Facebook, all all the places. Uh, my email too, if you want to shoot me an email and ask questions, is just steve at weedeman.com, W-I-I-D-E-M-A-N.com. Feel free to email me any questions or um, ideas, or if um, if you want to talk shop, I'm, I'm all about it. Well, thank you so much, Steve. This has been fantastic. Really informative. Thank you, Lauren. It's great being on the show. Hey, everybody. I'm Dale. And I'm Tamara. We're hosts of the Kainos Project podcast. Where we help you tackle ancient Christian truths in an everyday settings. To learn more and subscribe, go to lifeaudio.com. Are you looking for a holistically minded healthcare practitioner who truly treats root cause rather than symptom suppression? Unfortunately, even in the alternative healing professions, this isn't a given. That's why I've created wholehealthdoctor.com, a resource to help connect patients to healthcare practitioners in their area who share a root cause philosophy. Alternatively, most of the practitioners listed also practice telehealth. So if there isn't anyone local to you, you can still find a great practitioner to help you regain optimal health. Go to wholehealthdoctor.com. That's whole healthdr.com, type in your location or just the specialty that you're looking for and find the practitioner who's right for you. Thanks for listening to Christian Natural Health. This show is run by you, so please write in with topic and guest suggestions for future shows. For more great content, subscribe to Dr. Lauren's blog at www.drlaurendeville.com or follow her on Facebook or Twitter at Dr. Lauren DeVille. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to share it with your friends and give us a five-star rating in iTunes. It really helps us to stand out so other people can discover great content as well. Have a great week and God bless you. Scripture and brain science agree. Meditating on God's Word transforms us and reduces stress in our lives. I'm Jody Nisnik, host of So Much More, Creating Space for God, a scripture meditation podcast. And each week I give you space to hear God's word, listen to the spirit and pray about what's on your heart. And then we have a thoughtful conversation with guests to help us go deeper. Listen and subscribe at lifeaudio.com.